I'll just go ahead and lay out some of the law because we really have a must versus should dichotomy here. So the, the law is actually quite protective of what you might call government speech. In other words, government officials have the ability to try to convince or persuade private entities to take a course of action or refrain from a course of action. And it's actually more broad than many people might think um, that uh, if you're going to look, go through the, the case law, you're going to find that if I'm challenging uh, an action because the government um, convinced a private company to take a particular kind of action, it is a high bar to show coercion. Uh, and you're going to have to show there, there, there are multi-factor tests um, that are, you know, difficult to apply. But as a, as a general matter, that the bar for coercion is going to be pretty high. Um, and you're going to have to show some existence of some real regulatory authority. You're going to have to show that the speech was perceived as a threat. You're going to have to show, for example, whether the speech that is coming from the government uh, refers to adverse consequences. And when you look at the, in other words, um, while the law protects private entities from express threats from the government um, and implied, the implied has got to be implied so strongly it almost becomes express. For example, there's a key case out of the Second Amendment involving the FBI trying to um, get a, a a filmmaker to take down uh, advertisement for a movie claiming there was going to be a government takeover of New York. And to help persuade, persuade, the FBI sent agents to the guy's home. Oh okay. <laughs> and... And in that circumstance, what the Second Circuit said was, yeah, that's probably a First Amendment violation, but we're going to give the government officials qualified immunity anyway. Mm. <laughs> and so, so that sort of shows kind of how far it has to go to be clearly a threat. Um, so from the legal sense, under existing law, it was hard for me to find clear evidence of the government crossing the line. Mm -hmm. OK, I'm not saying they they didn't. It's just the line is a lot further down the line than you might think. OK, so the question that I have for you, Camille, is let's put aside the did they violate the First Amendment or not question, which I think is open. And should they do should the government have intervened use? Let's just presume for the moment it was constitutional. Should do we want the government interacting with Twitter the way we Twitter files expose the government interacting with Twitter. Yeah, I think it. I've got to put it into some different buckets. I mean, certainly okay. when I looked at Robbie's reporting about Facebook and their uh, interactions with the CDC, it seemed very much as if Facebook was interested in and perhaps even grateful for CDC's yeah. involvement, that they, they wanted them to help figure out what they should and shouldn't be flagging online. Now, whether or not that has anything to do with some of the kind of public chastising that Facebook had endured, both with respect to COVID in general and the purported misinformation that was there, which we were told repeatedly was quote unquote killing people. Um, but that probably also had something to do with the Russiagate drama, which was a very interesting case study and actually featured Facebook both apologizing profusely for allowing certain kinds of things to be published on their platform and for quote unquote Russian disinformation to be um, published there. And not that the Russian misinformation is quote unquote, but the, the proportionality of the concern there is, is something that, that ought to be flagged. Um, I don't know if those interactions and the kind of persistent threat to regulate Facebook in some sort of dramatic way was something that perhaps made them a little more open to the possibility of coordinating with the CDC. But in either case, they did want some of that. So allowing for some of that is probably appropriate. Um, but in other instances, um, the you know, criminal investigations that were taking place, the, where Facebook had to provide some kind of direct access um, to different, uh, not Facebook, but Twitter um, in this particular case, to 
to their systems um, and had these kind of ongoing correspondence with different government agencies um, and different offices. Um, I think that that's a little bit more um, frustrating. And at a minimum, uh, because I, I'll acknowledge, you know, the blurry line that you described is is quite blurry, um, perhaps frustratingly blurry, but a bit more transparency here in general would do a great deal to put me at a little bit more at ease. Um, I certainly don't like the prospect of federal um, operatives showing up at your house, um, encouraging you to do things <laughs> no. um, because it's a, it's a really nice homestead you've got here. I'd hate to... <laughs> you know, take you away and put you in a cage or something like that, or for something to happen to you. Perhaps they're a little vaguer um, and more sophisticated than that um, in order to induce me to remove content. I mean, that just, that makes me deeply uncomfortable. Yeah, I think of a difference between, let's suppose, so the intelligence, the, the, the FBI has a counterintelligence mission. It also has a law enforcement mission. Let's, let's, let's stick with the example of the filmmaker who's putting out a a war of the world style mockumentary or not really mockumentary faux, faux documentary of an, a government takeover. Let's suppose the FBI gets intelligence that people are believing that this is imminent and that the government takeover is imminent and they have credible concerns of violence because folks are believing this sort of, you know, the trailers or whatever for this fake documentary are illust are talking about actual plans that have been uncovered. Right. Um, I think it's totally fine for the FBI to call a filmmaker and say, we have received concrete intelligence that says that people might act violently. And what we're saying is, is there can, anything you can do to prevent that? Right. Like that, that to me, that seems like something different from sort of seeing it and saying, oh, I could see how somebody would be really fooled by this. Let's go to his house <laughs> and tell him. So if you have actionable intelligence that's directly within the mission and scope of law enforcement, um, such as this Twitter account is actually Russian. This is actually Russian and it is actually, um, to me, I have absolutely no problem with that. Well, what I do have more of a problem with is some of what we saw Twitter doing, which was, hey, this account is violating your terms of service. This account is violating your terms. I don't want the FBI monitoring Twitter right. to see whose tweets are violating the terms of service. Now, that yeah. doesn't mean that it's not that it violates the First Amendment for them to say, hey, Camille has violated the terms of service. I'm just highlighting this. You can do whatever you want with it. That doesn't violate the First Amendment in all likelihood, but I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it also sounds like a lot of the things that you're describing um, with respect to this this genuine threat that exists, that there probably could be some sort of public declarations about what's happening here that don't disclose any information that might say jeopardize an investigation that's ongoing. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily expect them to say something about that with respect to like a, a Russian asset who's operating a Twitter account. But if in fact there is this kind of publicly presented information that is potentially dangerous and potentially confusing cultivating the credibility necessary to be able to issue some sort of public remarks and direct them even at the the various social media companies seems totally appropriate. Um, and I think if that happens alongside um, showing some additional information or detail to the companies in question, then that is even better. Um, but that strikes me as the appropriate way to get this done. And a lot of the kind of clandestine conversations that are taking place. Uh, however, like that culture of secrecy around that kind of uh, interaction, um, I think is generally not healthy um, and is probably going to lead to things that if, if they're not outright abuses, look like abuses.